So what we'd like to do today is uh, get some uh, business affairs out of the way, then we'll have lunch, and then we'll have our special guest, Don Graham. And as I think you know, we're going to do this in interview format, similar to what we've done uh, before with Bill Marriott and, and Larry Summers and others. So first, I'd like to uh, recognize the ambassador from Canada who's here, Ambassador Dower. Thank you very much. And I'd uh, like to, uh, I think the ambassador from France is due, but I don't think he's here yet. Um, I'd like to recognize our uh, event sponsors, PNC Bank, Michael Harold, if he's here. Okay. And a company, I think it's called the Washington Post Company. Um, Bo Jones and uh, Catherine Weymouth and uh, Steve Hills, are they here? They're Catherine right there, thank you. And uh, Catherine Bradley from the City Bridge Foundation. Catherine? Eric. <laughs> and PricewaterhouseCoopers, Chris Simmons, I think, is not here today. Uh, the, the event sponsor's uh, contributions go towards our fellowship program, which I'll talk about in a moment. Um, I'd also like to announce that we did have the dinners that had to be canceled as well. Some dinners that we have, the private dinners we have at people's homes, had to be canceled. Some have been rescheduled. I'd like to thank Debbie Salzberg and Mitchell Shear for actually hosting a dinner earlier this month before the snow, I guess. And John Coleman is rescheduling his dinner for March the 23rd at the Jockey Club. Catherine Weymouth has rescheduled hers for March the 15th and uh, her house. And uh, we will have another series of such dinners in May. And if you're interested, uh, just to talk to or be in touch with Lyle's car. Um, I'd also want to talk about the scholarship and update you on that. As I think people know, we have a scholarship program where we give two five we give five thousand dollars scholarships to two students from each of the sixteen public high schools in the District of Columbia. This year, we're expanding it to uh, include uh, six or five charter schools: Friendship Collegiate, Cesar Chavez, Hyde Leadership, Washington Mathematics, Science, Technology, and Thurgood Marshall Academy. And it's hoping that that works well. We'll expand the charter uh, program as well. And uh, what we've done, as you know, is give the scholarships. We'll have the awardees at our spring dinner. And uh, I think it was a very good event last year where they all showed up, and I think they were very pleased to, uh, to meet many of you. And uh, I hope you thought it was a good dinner when we, when we had that. That was the Ingenuity event. And uh, also, I want to thank HSBC, Accenture, and PricewaterhouseCoopers for providing some mentoring services to the scholarship winners. And if other organizations are interested in doing so, we'd very much appreciate your letting us know. Our next event will be April the 8th um, on Thursday. It'll be a, a lunch. And it will be, uh, our guest speaker will be Peter Orzag, who will tell us how we're about to balance the budget, I hope. <laughs> and finally, our annual corporate partners, I'd like to acknowledge them as well. Um, uh, Bingham McCutcheon, Barry Dierenfeld, who is here, I just saw him. Okay, thank you, Barry. HSBC, Amy Daniels. Amy, thank you. And information management consultants, uh, Sadakar Shinoy. Sadakar is, there he is. PricewaterhouseCoopers. Is Chris Simmons is not here. Is anybody else from Price Waterhouse? Okay, thank you. And uh, that other firm, uh, Carlisle Group, yes. Um, and I guess they're right here. And Ed Mathias is not here today, but a lot of other people, David Marchick and others. So thank you. Uh, now we're going to have lunch, and then very shortly I'll come up and we'll have the interview with Don. I think you'll find it very, very interesting. So please enjoy your lunch. Okay, we're going to start. Um, First, I want to acknowledge that the uh, ambassador from France is here. He just showed up, Ambassador Bimal. Thank you. And um, for anybody who thinks that the presidency of the Economic Club of Washington doesn't have enormous responsibilities, among them is uh, something like this. Uh, who lost this key? <laughs> anybody claim this? Uh, somebody a left it? Very impressive. Uh, very impressive attachment. Um, well, nobody obviously wants to claim it. With the bear keychain. All right, I will leave it up here. If somebody who is too embarrassed to admit it's theirs uh, can come up later. The bear says, I love Chicago, <laughs> if that helps. So um, we're very pleased today to have Don as our guest. Um, Don, of course, has been a leader in the Washington business and philanthropic community for many decades, and it's really hard to think of anybody who has been a leader as long as Don in both those areas in our community. Uh, Don is 
course, from Washington, but actually I'm pleased to say that he actually was born in my hometown of Baltimore, but he was raised in Washington, D.C., went to St. Albans, graduated from there in 1962, went to Harvard, graduated in 66 from Harvard, where he was president of the Crimson, which is the student newspaper. And in those days, and I graduated from college not long thereafter, uh, there weren't a lot of people volunteering for military service. But Don did. He volunteered. He went to Vietnam, spent about a year and a half there. And then when he came back, he didn't join the family newspaper. He actually joined the D.C. police force and spent about a year and a half as a D.C. Uh, patrolman. I don't believe, however, that I arrested anyone now in the room. <laughs> uh, maybe I should have. Right. <laughs> Wasn't for a lack of trying, right? Yeah. Um, he then did join the family newspaper, and I say the family newspaper, it was bought actually in 1933 by Don's grandfather, Eugene Meyer, and to show you how the world's changed, Eugene Meyer was the chairman of the Federal Reserve Board, and on the side he was able to buy a newspaper. Uh, today, uh, I don't think Ben Bernanke well, is not, buying not a quite. newspaper. He was the former, former he was chairman. a okay. former governor, they didn't have a chairman at that okay. point. Okay, okay. Uh, okay, so Ben Bernanke won't be buying newspapers no. either. Right? No. Um, uh, eventually, Don's father uh, became the publisher, and eventually Don's mother did. And Don uh, worked his way up, and uh, he joined the newspaper actually in 1971, and in 1976 became the general manager of the newspaper, in 1979 the publisher of the newspaper, and became in 1991 the CEO, and in 1993 the chairman of the board of the parent company. In the year 2000, he gave up his publisher title to Bo Jones, who's a member of uh, our club. And in 2008, um, he both gave up that title to Catherine Weymouth, who's now the publisher of the Washington Post. The Washington Post, most of you recognize, is a major newspaper, and of course it has uh, a very large penetration in this, in this region. I think of, of the top 10 re uh, cities in the country, metropolitan areas, the Washington Post has a deeper penetration than any other uh, newspaper in those top 10 markets. But the Washington Post is more than the Washington Post a newspaper. The Washington Post Company has cable, com cable uh, operations, broadcast operations, and also something that many people may have remembered from when they were studying for their SAT scores, Stanley Kaplan. And through a very prescient um, purchase in the mid-1980s, Stanley Kaplan was purchased by the Washington Post Company, and it's now grown to be the largest part of the Washington Post Company. It's an education, proprietary education company that does much more than uh, college preparations and other things. It does a wide array of educational um, uh, uh, things for, for people at all uh, walks of life. Uh, the Washington Post Company has done quite well under, under Don's leadership, despite the fact that newspapers have been under challenge. And uh, because of the, of the Kaplan and other parts of the company, the company's actually done uh, far better than its newspaper peers around, around the United States. Don has also been actively involved in philanthropic activities. He was the founder, really, and, and, and the principal leader of of DC CAP, which is College Access Program, which helps people who are in DC public schools um, get training to uh, go on to college and also provide scholarships to them. And he's been very active in making that a very important uh, charitable uh, activity in, the, in this community. And it really survives and really thro uh, prospers and thrives because of Don's efforts. Uh, Don has also been involved in the uh, Federal City Club, uh, the, and the Federal City Club, and also. Uh, for, for which actually his father started in the 1950s, and Don has been a member of the board uh, since the, uh, in the early 70s. And Don um, also is very conversant with what young people are doing because he's also a member of the board of Facebook. And uh, he's a, a... We watch all your pages. <laughs> and I would say that Don is uh, more than most media executives, is a little more reserved, and actually the best indication of that is that this is the first time in the Cubs' nearly 25-year history that Don has actually appeared before this club. So we're very honored that Don has done that and very pleased. And I should, full disclosure, just uh, let people know right. that um, I do have a relationship with Don. Um, uh, when he, the Carter administration was ending, he was coming over to look for some bright young people who might join the Washington Post Company. There weren't a lot of people he would put in that category from the Carter administration. but. <laughs> He did find one very, very talented young woman, and that person became his special assistant and later became my wife. And um, Alice uh, worked for Don for several years before doing some other things. So I appreciate uh, Don's coming today, and let me start off. I remember meeting you in 1981, and I, we have these 
clashing pinstripes up here, but neither of us had a suit like this at the time. And David was best known because uh, two years into the Carter administration, Newsweek wrote a profile of the administration and said that it thrived on the energy of young staffers and it singled out David who had, uh, for the first 18 months of the Carter administration, never eaten a meal outside the White House, including on weekends when the mess was closed but he ate from the vending machines. True? Right, that's true, and I was famous for saying that machine food was underrated, but, um, <laughs> which, which it is. So um, I guess my first question is, Don, when you came back from Vietnam, uh, you became a D.C. policeman. Why did you do that and not join the family's uh, newspaper company? Well, it was, uh, it, first of all, David, thanks for the nice introduction. And second, uh, the year was 1968, and I was discharged from the Army in July, and uh, the the folks my age will remember that in D.C. there was a major riot in April after Martin Luther King's assassination. And I was, uh, uh, I, my mother, uh, who had become publisher five years ago, had asked me to come work for the Post, and I had made up my mind to do that. But I thought, I thought I would be, uh, I thought I'd be better on the newspaper if I first learned something about the city from somebody else's point of view. The police at the time were, uh, because of the war, and bec uh, two things, because of the draft, it was all men at the time, and because of the, uh, because both President Johnson and President Nixon feeling that crime in the district might become an issue had added enormously to the size right. of the department, they were thousands of officers short, and I, uh, I asked them about becoming a police officer, and I told them I would only be pre prepared to serve about 18 months, and they said that would be above average. And, and uh, did you regard that job as more dangerous than serving in Vietnam? No. no. Vietnam was much more dangerous, but police officers, uh, being a police officer is a dangerous job. There, were, there was one officer in my precinct who was killed in the line of duty, and, and uh, since uh, Sherry Doggett is here. I've got to say that at, even at that time, uh, Heroes Inc., which was founded by Bud and is now run by Cherry, was taking care of the uh, families, co college education and whatnot of officers killed in the line of duty. So it was, well, what there was a kind of random danger to it. At the time I was on the department, uh, the son of the mayor of College Park, who might have been a Prince George's County officer, who was definitely on one of the departments in Prince George's County, was killed responding to a call for a loud radio. People in the next department had called and said, there's right. loud music coming, get, knock on the door and tell them to turn it down. And the guy knocked on the door and there was a bank robber inside who did not think that was why he was knocking on the door, just shot so, him dead. So what did your mother say when you said, I'm gonna be a decent She person? was not crazy about it. Yeah. Well, your grandfather, as I mentioned, bought the Washington Post out of bankruptcy. And in those days, I don't, people here probably don't remember this, but there were seven to ten newspapers in Washington, something there like that? There were five, and we five. were the fourth. Okay, five. Okay. $825,000. So it wasn't a foregone conclusion that the Washington Post would become what it became. No. Far um, from it. But let's suppose your grandfather hadn't done that. Have you ever thought what you would have done with your career if you hadn't gone into the newspaper world? I don't know. I was a real little newspaper junkie when I was a kid. I was the editor of my high school paper and my college paper. And I was clearly drawn to it. And that, that may have been because I hero worshiped my father who was you know, one of the greatest guys I ever knew. And, and, uh, but I, th I think I'd, as I then was, I'd have been attracted to newspapers in some way, I think. But I, I you know, David, you, you remember this, but anybody younger than uh, 50 or so does not. When we went to college, you did not spend a lot of time thinking, what's going to be my career? Because you knew that as soon as you got out of college, either you were going to be drafted right. or you were going to do something so that you wouldn't be drafted. And, uh, <laughs> uh, but those were your choice of careers. And uh, so, I, oddly, uh, as a man, they were not drafting women at that point. It was, uh, 
uh, that froze you as far as thinking right. about a long-term career. Right. Um, you mean everybody in those days wasn't rushing to Goldman Sachs, I guess? Uh, uh, Ninety-five percent of the men in my graduating class uh, went to grad school. Really? Or said at the time that they planned to go to grad school, which was deferrable. deferrable. Well, let me ask you, in the time that you've been at the Post, now you joined in 1971, um, what would you say has been the biggest challenge? The Pentagon Papers publication, the uh, Watergate story, or the decline in classifieds and the competition from the Internet? None of the above. Uh, the, uh, there's no question uh, that the biggest challenge uh, at the Post since I've been there was the Pressman strike in 1975 and 6, where uh, my mother tells the story very vividly in a whole chapter of her book. Uh, we were expecting the outcome of a normal negotiation. Instead, uh, there, they, there was an elaborate charade to make us think that negotiations would continue at 4 o'clock in the morning. Uh, the presses were stopped. The f they beat up the foreman and sent him to the hospital. They disabled and took important operating parts off every press. They disabled the fire extinguishers on one press and set the building on set the press set set it on fire in a newspaper press room full of paper. And uh, we were, you know, that was the challenge of a lifetime. Well, you were and living. We, were you live in the building then? You didn't go home. You were living there. Well, I. I I got a call at home saying that all this had happened. I came in and I didn't leave for 26 days. And as I remember from your mother's book, she took on the job, among other things, of answering classified calls. She did. People would call yeah. in and they'd be speaking to Kay Graham and say, uh, you know, here's the ad and so forth. She, Catherine's here in the audience and I remember my sister Lally was in New York at one point and said, my mother had called her and said, and said, Lally, there's this pony for sale and, you know, and, and she said, <laughs> She said, Mom, where are you? And she said, I'm down taking these classified ads. I thought Catherine might want a pony. So, yeah. She absolutely did. Yeah. So tell me what it's like. Uh, everybody has a mother, but everybody doesn't have a mother who's the most famous uh, woman in America. You had to work in a company where your mother was yeah. your mother, but also your boss. How, how, would, how did that work? Well, to begin with, when I was growing up, she wasn't the most famous woman in America, and she wasn't the publisher of the Post. She was just my mother. And... Uh, uh, she, my mother wrote an autobiography, which I would highly recommend to a few copies remain at Better Bookstores everywhere. And, and won uh, the Pulitzer Prize. Yeah, won the Pulitzer Prize. And uh, it was a remarkable book because she was so honest about how she felt all the way through and how she felt was terrified. She had never been to business school. She hadn't worked. She'd worked as a reporter many years before but she had never worked in a business and she certainly never run anything. And, uh, and you cannot, you know, no matter how good you are at mental gymnastics, it's very hard to put yourself back in the mindset of 1963 and try to imagine what it felt like to be a woman running a major business. When we went public in 1971, my mother was the only CEO, the only woman CEO of a Fortune 1000 company, 999 oh. guys in her. And she was, you know, I said terrified, and you know, nervous doesn't begin to describe it. She was, she, she felt, she, her entire career she felt worried that she was doing something to, to screw things up. And said that to people constantly and sought advice. Uh, since I know a lot of, when I came into the newspaper business, I would guess that a little more than 50% of newspapers in the US at that time were probably owned by a local family. And uh, newspapers have this close association with retailers. And there were a lot of family retail businesses in DC, some of which will be remembered by uh, most of which are now gone. Marlow, Marlowe's would be an exception, and Rosenthal, and Dark Cars, and a few others. Uh, so Long and Foster, some of the. But uh, uh, I knew a ton of young people who were working for their fathers, and each of those relationships was different. I, I think one reason that that the two of us were able to work, it, it is, it's just different working for your mother. And uh, she, she was, 
she was ultra great about it. She was, uh, uh, when she stepped aside and made me the chairman of the company, or when in 1979 she made me the publisher of the Post, which was a job she'd had for 16 years, right. she really let me run the place. When it was time to choose an editor, I chose the editor and, and so on. But, I mean, she's I sought her advice all the time, by the way, partly because I knew she would never say, the hell with advice, here's what I want you to do. Well, but she would say, um, yeah, how are your numbers doing? How's the paper doing? And also, could you get a haircut? Or yep. you, she would That's for sure. Right. Okay. She, uh, I'm, I'm, I dressed up for this, but most of you know me well enough that you know what I look like normally. And, and uh, she used to moan to people. She'd say, why am I surrounded by the worst dressed staff of any newspaper in America? She was mostly referring to Bo and me. Right. She would say, not you, Ben. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So one day, a uh, investor bought some stock in the Post Company. Yeah. I think about five percent. He showed up, and it was a guy named Warren Buffett. And um, he later became, uh, of course, an uh, important part of uh, the Post history. But he's now a member of the board and has been for some time. What's it like to look at an acquisition when Warren Buffett is on the board? I and mean, if Warren doesn't want to do it, will other people go over his objection, or is his advice just not always taken? Well, I can think of plenty of times when Warren has said, I don't have any insight into that, uh, if you're looking at uh, companies that have any technology component or whatnot, he won't say yes or no, he'll say, I just, you know, that's not something I know much about. But in general, I, you know, I'm, I'm trying to call up an instance of something Warren and I have disagreed on, an, an acquisition Warren and I have disagreed on. You want his advice, and his advice will be the right advice. And uh, he, my mother, uh, in, in the subtext of this autobiography is a lot about the relationship between a chairman and a board. And unlike a lot of CEOs, she wanted a super strong board, again, because of her own frame of mind, when she had a problem, she wanted smart, experienced advisors who would not tailor their advice to what they thought her wishes were, but would tell her what they thought. And Warren, uh, Warren must have bought stock. Th this was in the 1974-75 recession and stock market decline, which you missed, but uh, but it I, was I've made up for that. Uh, yeah. Others, but, uh, <laughs> well, only think if you'd had the opportunity. Right. Yeah, but so, well, but what's it like uh, to be at a board meeting where you've got Robert McNamara, Warren Buffett, Barry Diller. You've got some pretty high-powered, smart guys there. We've got an unbelievable board, and uh, they are there because you know when eh, we aren't we aren't a very big company. We're a sub Fortune 500 company, but but you know when you make for our scale a big corporate decision, you want the best advice you can get. And Warren, you know, I would say. You know, over the last 35 years, you simply could not have had a better right. person on a corporate board. And let me ask you now, now that you're not the publisher of the Post, you're the, the CEO and chairman of the parent company, uh, what do you spend most of your time on? Are the other parts of the Post, um, Stanley Kaplan or Kaplan or the cable or the, or the uh, broadcast? Or wh where do you spend most of your time now? What part of the company? Uh, I spend most of my time on what we're going to do next, you know, what are we going to do with the money we make, and on who are going to, you know, who are going to be our key people. And uh, I think those are okay. the two big jobs I have is if, you know, if uh, uh, the uh, Warren, Warren is full of uh, sage observations, and uh, one, uh, he, he talked about CEO selection, and and uh, he referred to the fact that in many companies you you run the biggest business within the company and then they promote you up to be CEO and he said it's like you you play the piano well enough to get to Carnegie Hall and then they give you a violin but his he would view the he would view the key job of the CEO as capital allocation and that's of course the way he runs right. Berkshire and um, how much longer am I going to be able to get the Washington Post online for free I, we, we have absolutely no plans to change that, really? so I'm pleased to say that uh, you, can, uh, you can count on that for the immediate future, and, and uh, if we change that, it'll be Catherine, not me, but, uh, but
But, but so now, if I want to get the Washington Post online, you give your, your code, your, your email address or something like that. Yeah. And do you sell those email addresses to people who are going to be no. sending me stuff? No. You wouldn't. You wouldn't. We'd be crazy to to. Uh, okay. To uh, sell uh, your email address. And to is your biggest competitor now um, the the online? Um, uh, Craigslist or people like that, or that has taken away most of your advertising. Is it well uh, for all newspapers? Newspapers have online competitors uh, for internet job ads, internet, uh, and to a somewhat lesser extent, internet auto and real estate ads. And those competitors have taken significant market share, but uh, the entire business in those three categories was just leveled by the recession right. of 2008 and 9. So I would think newspapers will be coming back somewhat in advertising from right. 2009 levels. But if you look at our job listings or, or uh, the job listings of national online job companies, you don't see much of a flicker at this point. Now, um, I assume over sometimes when you were the publisher, um, the President of the United States or his representative would call you and say, you're about to publish something that's going to violate national security, or this is very important that would damage the country. Have you had those calls, and, and how do you deal with those kind of calls? Do you always uh, listen to what the President wants to do, or you just ignore them? How do you deal with that? Well, you always listen, whether it's uh, the President or whether it's just somebody who has heard you're planning to run a story and feels you shouldn't. But, you know, if you're, if you're, let's take the kind of national security case you're talking about. Uh, Pentagon I would, Papers case. Well, that was, an ex that was absolutely an extreme. Uh, the, in the Pentagon Papers case, uh, the New York Times had already published very large exclusive excerpts from the Pentagon Papers and when they were and they were actually enjoined by a federal district court from publishing any more. Right. At that point the guy who had leaked them to the Times, Daniel Ellsberg, leaked them to the Post. We began to publish and were immediately enjoined by our own district court and uh, threatened with all kinds of uh, consequences. My mother was told indirectly by the Attorney General that they wanted to call our attention to the fact that if a company was found guilty of a felony, like violating the Espionage Act, they couldn't own FCC licensed television stations. Right. And what made that particularly challenging for her was we were going public that week that she made the decision right. to publish the Pentagon Papers. But in, in more normal cases, what you do is you listen very carefully and take notes and find the name of who you can call back for more detail about why this is supposed to be damaging to national security. But have you ever published anything you, you regretted publishing in that context or? Well, have we published anything we've subsequently regretted publishing? I don't want to say a categorical no, but I, I don't, I don't, you know, that instance doesn't right. leap to mind. I mean, we, we, uh, we generally have an impulse to publish. I mean, our, our um, but generally, what I'm going to, what I would do, where I back in the days when I was the publisher, and what Catherine would do today is call the editor of the Washington Post, who is also conveniently right, right here, Marcus Brockley. And uh, uh, this summer, for instance, uh, Bob Woodward got and published the 66-page memo that General McChrystal right. uh, wrote about his doubts and concerns about the war in Afghanistan. Bob talked to Marcus and said, I think this is a story and I think we ought to get it in the paper. Marcus wholeheartedly agreed. Bob began making calls. And uh, at that point, the government weighed in and said, wait a minute, there's stuff in here that would be highly damaging to national security. And we listened and we tried. We, we do not want to put somebody's life right. in danger. We do not want to do something to imperil the national security of the United States, but we have often found in the past that people will invoke that very quickly. You know, in the, in the case of the Pentagon Papers, it's very instructive. Uh, the, uh, the judge in the Pentagon Papers case in the Federal District Court in Washington asked the government's lawyer what was the most damaging allegation in all of the five volumes of the Pentagon Papers. And, 
the Solicitor General uh, consulted with his State and Defense Department advisors and said that it was something called Operation Marigold, which was an indirect approach to the North Vietnamese that the U.S. government had made through the British. And our reporter sitting in court said, uh, they testified that uh, about that in the Senate Foreign Relations mm -hmm. Committee hearing last month, and we looked it up and showed that to the judge, which had a certain weight. Right. And, uh, <laughs> And the next, the next issue of Life magazine had an article by Harold Wilson, the Prime Minister of Great Britain, entitled Operation Marigold. And, uh, you know, later on, that Solicitor General, Erwin Griswold, wrote an op-ed piece in the Post saying, I was wrong. You know, we should never have. So, but that is not always the case. The government, you know, I'm a, right. I'm a former, I had a very distinguished military career. I got up to being a specialist fifth class, and, and uh, but I, but I, uh, uh, the government, you, you should always listen when people call you. What about we when do. business people call you? Like they say, you're going to write a terrible, the post is going to write a terrible article about my company, it's not accurate, or a politician calls you. Generally, people have been known to call and we listen. And if, if their argument is you're going to publish something and it's inaccurate, I'll call Catherine or we'll call Marcus, and Marcus will listen to him. And if he feels that, in fact, the caller is right and the story is factually inaccurate, okay. we'll, certainly, we'll certainly listen to that. So but we'll listen to it not merely for politicians, not merely for business people. Such things arrive in stories. I mean, uh, you know, we've had frantic calls from parents when we were writing something involving a school that they felt would identify their student, right. and their child. and call them up for, you know, you, What's you, the best way to persuade a publisher not to publish something in case you <laughs> Well, in your case, I wouldn't uh, put a whole uh, lot of, uh, <laughs> of effort into that. But no, the best, the best case is put forward, uh, you know, tell the, tell, the, tell the truth and tell us what, okay. what and tell us uh, if you want something not published because the story is inaccurate or wrong, make that case and we will listen and we'll, but, but, we're not going to, you know, we are reporters. We'll take your word for it. I do remember one of the valuable things I learned back in cop days was, uh, these are famous scenes in every police movie for a thousand years, is you can listen to one side of a story and be so convinced that that person's telling you the truth and they're right, and then you walk into the next room and hear the other side of the story, and oh my God, you know, you, you do not, reporting is challenging because you've got to listen to everyone. Now, over the years, people come to the Washington Post to meet editors and publisher yeah. and sometimes to get endorsements and so forth. Of all the years you've been sitting in these meetings, who is the most impressive person? Who came and said something that was so compelling that you said, wow, we have to write about this person. This person is really uh, a gifted intellect or this person is much more persuasive in person than I ever mm -hmm. dreamed. Is anybody that Well, that happens, all, that happens all the time. But you, I, I met Mandela that, that, you know, in any list of the most impressive people in the world. He has to rank very near the top. But I think the most moving day uh, in such a meeting was that uh, the Post for years had an editorial page editor named Meg Greenfield who was one of the great people in the history of journalism. And when Andrei Sakharov was, uh, was uh, uh, banished within Russia he was sent off to a provincial town and forbidden to communicate with anybody in the capital. And Meg and Steve Rosenfeld, her deputy, who was written up very beautifully in last month's Washingtonian uh, by one of his children, uh, 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 wrote a weekly editorial entitled, Where is Andrei Sakharov? that ran you know, every week in the post while he remained uh, in exile, and when Sakharov and his wife came to Washington, they asked for Meg and Steve right. to come over and meet wow. with them, which was extremely moving, and uh, that, that I will always remember. Now, the circulation of the Washington Post is pretty much held up, I would say, no, relatively it's, it's, speaking. It's declined, but it's decli it's, we've done quite a bit better than most newspapers. Right. Compared to others, you've done reasonably well. Do you expect the circulation to be flat or go down, or do you think News, my, my children, for example, uh, don't read newspapers. They read everything online. And so I don't, I've observed a younger generation doesn't kind of read a lot of newspapers. 
Do you think that's a problem, that younger people tend to get everything online? Well, we're on the very lucky side of that because Washington uh, is the most educated market in the United States, and uh, newspaper readership or readership of anything coincides with education more than any other demographic. And uh, so as you kindly noted at the start, the Post is more widely read in white. And of course, we have an element of being the office bulletin board. You know, we, uh, we if, or if you work in the government, which many people right. do, uh, uh, they, they read us to find out what the boss is doing or what somebody, right. said somebody thinks the boss is no good or whatnot, you want to know that. But we, uh, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm a habituated newspaper reader. I get the newspaper at my door every morning. I could perfectly well walk upstairs and read it on the computer. I wouldn't think of it. You know, I'm, I'm, I, uh, I put in half an hour, 45 minutes reading the paper, and I do, you know, I, I love it. I, I really enjoy uh, that time, but, uh, your, your kids are in fact typical of the generation now in its 20s, maybe up to 35. I think the dividing line is when you went to college and they had a high-speed connection in your dorm room. Right. You know, you, got, you did your homework online and you, uh, you uh, talked to your friends online and you, you communicated with your teachers online. You know, you may never have left the room, just ordered pizzas in and went on. But uh, we, of course, you read the news online because you did everything else online. So we, we, we have more readers in that younger age group than any other right. paper going because Washington continues to attract these, these, uh, these outlier 25-year-olds right. who think working in the Federal Trade Commission is the most exciting career they can. You know, my fa my father was one of those once, and it is, and uh, and. Uh, uh, we, uh, the, so the post, but, but we are on the high side compared to other newspapers, but we are no exception in that most people that age uh, get their news on the internet and will continue to, and we have to reach them in ways that they find, uh, you know, in, in ways that are, are well suited to the internet and well suited to them. Today, would you recommend journalism as a career to young college students? you think that's a great future to journalism? I, I do. In fact, I think no matter what the, f you know, I, I think that in the future people are going to get their news from news organizations that employ reporters and editors and make money doing it. And whether that's us or not, we're, it depends on how smart we are. And if we adapt to changing circumstances, which we've done I think a pretty good job of so far, but you know, not as good, not nearly as good as we would like to be doing. Yeah. Uh, we have a chance of getting there, but it is going to be very challenging. Now, your father, I think, purchased uh, when he was the publisher of Newsweek. Yeah, is that right? And uh, you've owned Newsweek ever since uh, 1963. That time. Yeah, and uh, Newsweeklies, some people would say, don't have as big a future as they did before because everybody gets the news on the internet and so forth. Um, what is the future of Newsweek? Do you see it as? Uh, I, I actually think Newsweek. The time in Newsweek, uh, we, we have a, a guy who's done market research for our company and also for Coke and IBM and whatnot, who said he had never surveyed uh, on a product that had the strong appeal to its consumers of Newsweekly, so that people, people. Uh, like them because they make sense of a confusing, you know, after, after a week when your head has been spinning. And there was a, a story, my daughter posted something on Facebook this morning that said the earthquake in Chile had knocked the earth off its axis and had, uh, had, uh, uh, really? re, 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 had affected the amount of its rotation or something. And, you know, that, uh, yeah, that's, it, you, you get so much thrown at you in the course of a week that uh, that y you want something you trust to come along and take care of it. News Newsweek and Time have been uh, uh, have have quite strong reader appeal. How, how did you get involved with Facebook? Were you an early investor? Did you know the founder? And uh, are you the uh, most well, senior we're, person on that board? Oh, I'm I'm the most senior person on that board by decades. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I talked to what they call an all hands, a meeting of all the employees at Facebook, and I said, this, is, this must be very special to you because 
Only Facebook has had the wisdom to reach out to the newspaper industry for strategic advice <laughs> among major technology companies. And uh, I, I, uh, we, we are very lucky in the folks who work at our company, and there's a guy named Chris Ma who has uh, worked for us for decades. He was at Newsweek, and then later he was the editor of WashingtonPost.com, and he now works in corporate on development. And his daughter was in Mark Zuckerberg's class at Harvard and told Chris that when Mark came to Washington, they ought to meet. So Chris talked to Mark for a while and then brought Mark in to talk to me, and I met him in 2005 when they were on 30 campuses. And I thought it was the most extraordinary business I'd heard of in years. And, and uh, we, uh, we stayed in touch over the years, and, and uh, I, I, I went on their board a little more than a year ago. You're more prescient than, than I am because uh, my daughter is about to marry somebody who went to uh, Exeter and Harvard with uh, Mark, and uh, my son-in-law-to-be told me about this company was getting off the ground. He said, you should go out and invest in it. And I said, what's the likelihood that this guy is going <laughs> to have a company that I'm going to invest in? So, uh, That's unfortunately, um, I didn't, uh, wasn't quite as prescient as you were. Well, I got a story somewhat analogous to that. But let me but ask you, uh, right now, um, you expect your family will continue to own the post forever, as Warren Buffett says, or do you? Um, mm, you nothing see lasts forever, but I we have it. Uh, uh, but we, if if future generations of Grahams and Weymouths and Myers want to, they uh, it, it can go on for quite a while. And the two class stock uh, that yeah. media companies often use, the defense of that is what? Well, in in our case. Uh, we have had two classes of stock, one having a greater vote since 1947. So no one now owning a share of B stock, publicly traded stock in the Post, has ever bought it under any supposition except that right. it, was, it had limited voting rights. And uh, uh, I think there is, there is definitely, uh, a, you know, in, in a case like the Pentagon Papers, if the Nixon administration could have done anything to dislodge Kay right. Graham from being the owner of the Washington Post, they'd have done it. So there's a certain journalistic virtue in having that. I also think that, you know, we, we're we a, a real outlier of a company. We, uh, we do not pay any attention whatsoever to quarterly reported results. We report them. We're very meticulous about our record keeping. Right. And we are very thorough in our reporting. But, uh, you know, it's late in the first quarter. I don't have a clue what our first quarter earnings will be. I don't know what any analyst has, has estimated for our first quarter earnings, and I don't care. And I won't know when the quarter closes what any analyst has recommended or whether we're high or lower. And I said that to the analyst community when, when I first became the CEO in 1991, and it wasn't a hell of a lot different than what Kay had been saying before me. And my, my, my statement was, if you care what we're going to make for the next quarter, you shouldn't own the stock because management, you know, we are looking to build this company for a long term and we want shareholders who are not buying it because of what will happen for the next quarter. Well, the stock has done term. pretty well, I'd say, in the sense that my, when my wife uh, joined the company, or my wife-to-be joined the company, the stock I remember was $28 a share. and. Um, I know she had some options, I guess, and then it <laughs> went up to 900 plus, and went up to 900 plus, and is now at 430. 430. But uh, you know, we were, we have had the tides in the newspaper industry running against us, and we we uh, we got creamed in right. the 2008, 2009 market, as many others did. But who was the genius at the Washington Post who figured out that Stanley Kaplan was a good investment, and who actually made it? the great company that it became or division within your company? The guy who figured out it was that we should invest in it was Dick Simmons, the former president of our company who now lives in Alexandria, is probably known to quite a few people in this room. And uh, uh, Dick and to some extent Alan Spoon and Ross Hamachek who were working for Dick at the time and Alan was here for years, was a uh, an early internet investment pioneer and now is a venture capitalist in Boston but was with us for 18 years and sensationally important to us. Uh, they, they pushed for the acquisition of Kaplan and they all three would say that they completely misunderstood the business. And they, it, you know, buying it was the luckiest thing in the world for us. It turned out to be the greatest piece of strategic good luck we ever had. But we bought it on completely mistaken assumptions and in fact when we bought it from Stanley it was making eight million dollars a year and uh, 
10 years later, it was losing about $4 million a year, and uh, uh, it was taken over by a 29-year-old CEO named Jonathan Greyer who ran it for the next 17 years and ran it brilliantly, built it into uh, the multi-line, mm -hmm. multinational powerhouse it is today, and seamlessly handed it off to Andy Rosen, who was his longtime number two, and Andy had been the founder of Kaplan's single largest business unit, which is an online university, which now has about 60,000 mm -hmm. students. And um, Jonathan, I now I understand, has gone on to do God's work in the private equity world, I think. You know, <laughs> you, you've just built this colossus, David. Uh, David. And no, Jonathan, uh, we, Jonathan really did a sensational job for Kaplan and the Post Company, and he'll be very successful at whatever he does in the future. Um, one last question before some yeah. audience questions or guest questions. Uh, if somebody uh, wants to get a presidential or candidate endorsement, they come to the post. Do you actually, when you were the publisher, did you, did you make the decision yourself? Or is it a collegial? And, and does Catherine now make the decision? Who makes the decision about endorsements? Well, the, the editorial page of the post writes three editorials every day telling you what to think about various subjects. I, I need to read the editorial page every day so I know what to think. We run, a very, we run a very unusual editorial page in that we don't always think that one party or the other is right. And uh, we, we have your rare open-minded editorial page. We try to listen to the, the, the facts on any issue and, and make up our mind. In the rare case of a presidential endorsement, the publisher will be in the room and will, you know, her her, her views, you know, the, the publisher's views will be consulted. Mine were for years. Meg was the editor of the editorial page almost all the time that I was the publisher, and there, wa there certainly wasn't a case of presidential endorsements where we, where we disagreed. And you don't regret any endorsements that you've made? Yeah, I th uh, you know. You don't want to mention there, the one? There are some uh, I would be, be glad to take back, but, you know, uh, but okay. you, uh, you always get surprises. Okay, we have a few minutes for questions. Uh, just raise your hand. I think there might be a mic out there. Uh, there. Uh, if somebody has a hand up. I can see some, but not all of you, since I know more than half of the people in this room. Uh, it's Good afternoon. Uh, Mr. Graham, uh, having attended the uh, reception for Dr. Henry Louis Gates recently yeah. at the Madison Hotel, which was one of the most interesting and festive events that I've ever attended in Washington, I'd like to ask you about uh, some of the spin-offs that the Post has been involved in that uh, are relatively new, such as The Root, which is an online publication directed towards professional African Americans, uh, and some of the other things that you may be involved in that you have mentioned today that people might want to well, know about. Thanks. We, uh, we have started up about... We were lucky enough to buy Slate from Microsoft five years ago. It had been Slate was the first all online, well, maybe the second all online publication. It was started by Bill Gates and Michael Kinsley. And it became gradually more and more successful. And I have to say, at just the wrong time, I thought that uh, Slate's success suggested that we ought to try starting up uh, a couple of smaller content sites and see if we could grow audiences and ultimately be of interest to advertisers at just the wrong time because this all happened about five minutes before the world crashed in the end of 2008. But the route of which Skip Gates is the editor-in-chief uh, is a very, thank you for asking about it, it is a very lively, rapidly growing in audience uh, site for the African-American community whose editor now is an old friend of mine, Joel Dreyfus, who was Long ago, a reporter on The Post spent much of his career on Fortune and then became the editor of Red Herring out in Silicon Valley and spent a lot of his career as a technology reporter. Under Joel, it's going to become a sensational site. We also have a financial site called The Big Money. Within Slate, there is a women-focused site called Double X, which I, I highly recommend. And we also were lucky enough to buy the, the print magazine called Foreign Policy from the Carnegie Foundation, the Carnegie Endowment, and uh, we, Susan Glasser, the editor, has turned the website on foreign policy into the liveliest discussion of international affairs in the world. It's, it's recommended without reservation. So thanks for the question. Other questions? Here? Stand up, please. Uh, okay. Hi, Don, Barbara Reinecke. 
Just a quick question. Uh, I really miss the business section of the post, and I was wondering if there's any thought about reinstating that. Well, it's the, the business news in the post is now, in fact, in the A section. And I have to tell you, I, I think it is significantly more widely read where it is now than when we had a standalone section. I'll take your comment under advisement if, if others have advice for me when I'm leaving. I can tell you, because Catherine and Marcus tell me, that uh, we, we survey our readers all the time about how they feel about different aspects of the paper. And Business News had this huge jump up. Now, of course, the, the, uh, that the, last, the last 15 months or so, people have certainly been preoccupied with Business News, so that may have, uh, that may have something to do with it. But I appreciate the comment, Barbara, and I know, I know Marcus does too. Another question? One more, one or two more? Yes, right here. Um, okay. This looks like gonna be a professional question here. <laughs> it just might. Frank Cessna at George Washington University. So the New York Times is taking a year to figure out how to charge for at least elements, if not all of its online offering. You said you're not going to do that at the Post, but you have many times more unique visitors to your online section as you do to the print section. Uh, how do you make money out of that? Well, we're making pretty good money out of it by selling advertising against it. So the Times and is wrong? No, I, I think uh, we're going to be watching very closely what the Times does, as we've watched for years what the Wall Street Journal does. And there are several ongoing experiments with different pay models going on in the industry right now. A very smart guy named Steve Brill is running a company to try to do that. The Wall Street, the Dow Jones is running a company to try to do that. The Times is going to do something quite different. We're going to watch them all. We're going to learn as much as we can about them. It's perfectly possible that sometime down the road, the Post would consider uh, seeking to be, but we, but we have no plans to do that at the moment. And such plans, if there ever are any, are going to come up from Catherine and Marcus, not from me. Okay, one more question. Uh, right back here, last question, please. Don, how long will we be receiving the news on paper? Well, I think, you know, I'm, uh, I think for a very long time, because there are so many people uh, my age to fortunately uh, quite a bit younger who just prefer it that way. And we're in the business of satisfying readers, you know, so I, I think we want to get better and better at satisfying online readers, but we absolutely want to maximize the number of papers we sell and the amount of good we do for advertisers by, by doing that. If I could just throw out one last observation, David, we, uh, you mentioned in introducing me that I'm the founder of the DC College Access Program, which is a, a counseling, we're the college counseling, we're, we're a big part of the college counseling function along with the DC Public School Counselors for DC Public and Charter Schools. And uh, we, we are hosting on Monday night at the Kennedy Center a American Idol style competition among the most talented kids in the DC Public Schools, if any of you want to pay up a relatively paltry sum and uh, and come along. I also want to mention that this room is full of, you know, this uh, very intelligently since this is the Economic Club. This room is full of some of my favorite nonprofit people in all of D.C. And there is so much educational innovation going on in Washington right now. Not just in the D.C. public schools where innovation is famous, but in the charter school community, which is richly represented at Catherine Bradley's table here and with Catherine and her fellow uh, nonprofit executives. So if any of you want to meet some of the great education leaders in DC, go introduce yourself to Catherine. And, and uh, I'm on the board of KIPP DC, and I'm a longtime fan of the Friendship Schools, both of whose founders chairs are here. And thanks so much for the Thank chance to be with you. Thank you very much, Don, for doing this. We appreciate your, your take, giving us this much time. Yeah. Uh, one second, let me give you the gift. <laughs>